Thank you, Brother Victor, for blessing us with that appropriate, beautiful hymn. You recognize it, I'm sure? Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that what? Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Thank you so much for leading out in the singing as well. We were blessed by you and Sam. Welcome back to those who have uh, taken a little hi hiatus up uh, at Big Lake. We're glad you've come back to uh, spend time with us. Uh, I understand that you had a good time. Beautiful sunlight. Lots of snow. Except for the last hour, I was told. I, had, I understand you had some excitement that final hour, but we're glad you're back with us. And uh, so we're glad you're here. I will uh, give the... Uh, at the right time. Uh, so we, uh, this has been an interesting week, by the way, just so to update you quickly. Some of you who've been to my uh, office study here, you've been wondering for weeks. You've seen boxes there. The boxes are gone. I've been working. My wife has helped me. We've got all those boxes out of the way. They're gone. Uh, the books are on the shelf, but in, a, in disarray. But So if you do come to my office, there will be one book you will notice that stands there very prominently. It's called The Introvert Advantage. Who was here last week for church? You know what I'm talking about, right? Subtitle, How to Thrive in an Extrovert World. So you'll see the book sitting out there. And for those of you who missed the sermon last week, I want to urge you to, uh, uh, you can get a copy here. Um, but we also do have our things online. We're glad that you can visit with us. Uh, of course, this week we've, we've also heard other kinds of news that's happening. Um, I just heard it, I believe, yesterday, that from now onwards, if you're a golfer, any golfers here? Let me see the hands. Anybody plays golf or even mini golf? Putt, putt. Anybody here? Mm, come on. A lot of you. Good. You can now carry your golf clubs onto airplanes. You heard that news? It's causing quite a furor. And I'm interesting to hear the talk about the things they're now going to allow on airplanes. That was big news. Of course, there was bigger news in that uh, 1.3 billion people got a new president. China. I'm not sure if I'll ever pronounce his name correctly, but it's Xi Jinping or something of that nature. And then, of course, the, that's the largest country, the most people. And then we go to the smallest country. The Vatican is actually a country, you know that. They got a new leader, although he's also leader of 1.2 billion Catholics. As I've been listening to the news, interesting things happening, including just yesterday's news from our own, the only superpower on planet Earth right now. The USA has just uh, taken a decision to get new uh, missiles in missile defenses to bolster it because of uh, the saber rattling of North Korea. As I listen to the things happening, anybody been listening to the news as well? I see hands there. The interesting thing is the news sometimes can scare us, can get us unsettled. But we've come today to get good news from the Word of God. So I want to ask if you can pause for a moment as I pray that God will bless us that we can forget the cares of this world, not worry about superpowers, but the real power is here. Let's pray for a moment. Holy Father, we pause a moment thankful that today, once again, we can be blessed by the good news from your holy word. We're thankful and we want to praise you that you are the God who is always there. Last week we learned you promised us, I will be with you. And so today we claim that promise here in your house. We're thankful we can pray these things in the name of the God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to try something new today. And my uh, deacons right now are going to be passing out to you if you haven't gotten a copy. I know not everybody gets a copy of the bulletin. If you didn't get it, a copy of the bulletin, in the bulletin there's a special handout. Uh, and so if you didn't get it, sometimes one, a family might take one bulletin. And we make a couple of hundred copies, but we have extra copies of the handout, a study guide. And incidentally, if you want to take one home for family or friend, we have made sufficient copies for you so that you can do that. So uh, please uh, uh, raise your hand. And you will notice as you do that, that uh, we actually are reviewing what we had even the previous um, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we started with the study of the life of Judah, and the title was Back on Track. You remember, he was the fourth son of um, the uh, couple, uh, 
This is Jacob and Leah. And so we want to spend a little time reflecting um, on the rest of his story today. But I thought it would be helpful if I could hand out to you a copy of, of the study sheet you didn't have. And notice, I tried to fill it in for you in italics. You see that? That's as though you would have filled it in yourself. So you see that on, it'll say March 2 on the one side. But uh, we're not going to be spending our time on that side. As soon as our deacons, and thank you deacons for getting those to anybody who would like a copy. Um, so our title today is, uh, again, this is part two, the final part of the story of uh, Judah. It's a scriptural scoundrel from barter to martyr. You have this study guide or um, review sheet, so you can go home and you can have your notes in a little better order as uh, we review here very briefly. What I want to do is uh, to simply ask you the question as you go to this first verse. Those of you who missed our series, we were pointing out that uh, chapter 37, verse 36 of the book of Genesis has five points in it. And this is the end of that chapter. And you would automatically think that the next chapter would tell us the story of Joseph. This is talking about Joseph. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. And you would think verse 1 would pick up the story of Joseph. It doesn't. The story of Joseph is picked up in the following chapter, chapter 39. And so what uh, Moses, I believe by inspiration, does is he now uh, repeats what he said. Chapter 39, verse 1, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and part of an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. So, so chapter 38 is that sandwich, kind of the in-between one. Chapter 37 ends the story of Joseph. Chapter 39 picks it up again. And so that's what we have here. I believe it was an intentionally inspired interruption in the text. The story of Joseph's life. Divinely directed digression, if you please. And so we've been looking at the life of Judah. In fact, you'll notice that uh, chapter 38, verse 1, just a reminder, started this way. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers. And so we reminded you, we shared with you, the, 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 that time was the time when, of course, his father was in mourning for the loss of his son, Joseph, whom he thought had been killed by a wild animal. And just a brief review here for those of you who were here, and the rest of you, obviously, it's on your study sheet. We talked about the background, the family issues that Judah had. His father, Jacob, had spoiled him. He was a deceiver. That's the father. And, of course, we talked about the fact that he was in a polygamous home, in a fighting family. His his grandfather, well, Laban, was a deceiver and he was greedy. He came from a terrible background. And we shared that with you to help you understand that, you know, no matter what your background it, it is. And incidentally, I don't know of anybody who comes from a perfect family. We're all from dysfunctional families to some degree. Isn't that true? It's funny, except for Adam and Eve, right? <laughs> They were created by God, perfect in the garden. So I mention that just to remind us and gives us hope that no matter what our backgrounds, God can and will intervene in our lives. And we looked at the beginning uh, to see what kind of a man was Judah. We mentioned that he was a mercenary, he was cold, he was promiscuous, he was judgmental. And then at the end of our message two weeks ago, there was a hint of hope for a heart change. We mentioned it, that Judah was now getting back on track. And there were three steps for transformation, and uh, I put them there on that study sheet, the three steps for transformation on, this is the March 2 one, and there it says, acknowledge that you actually do have a problem, admit what the real reason is behind this problem or issue, act in full accordance with this new direction in your life. And uh, this was just to remind you of our previous message, uh, the most important text we looked at was this one, would you read it with me together, ready? The goodness of God leads you to repentance. So that's a brief overview of our message up to this point in time. And now we pick up the story. As you study the life of Judah, suddenly Judah disappears from the picture at the end of chapter 38. He's not there. Chapter 39 picks up the story of one of the favorite characters in the Bible. His name, Joseph. But what's interesting, if you read carefully, you will find that in chapter 42... Judah appears again. Now somebody says, I don't see it, Pastor. Now I'm, qu I'm quoting you from scripture. You want to open your Bibles, you want to mark it up. It says, where is Judah? <laughs> I'm suggesting that Judah returned home. But where is it? This is Jacob speaking. He said, behold, 
I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So notice. So what? Ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. Think a minute. How many brothers were, how many brothers were there all together? Twelve. Where was Joseph? In Egypt. Ten brothers go down. But notice the next verse. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. What's the implication? What has happened to Judah? Judah has what? He has one of the ten, which means he had left before, chapter 38. He had moved away from the family. Remember the story? What does it mean about Judah? Judah has come back. What changes began to happen? Judah returned to his family to his faith now if you have your study guide with you if you're watching us online we're glad you've joined us today we're going to be putting this online as well for for you but uh, if you're watching online but right there in our study sheet this is the first word in front in the pew there's a pencil there just look over there if you need a pencil raise your hand our deacons will be able to get one to you or a pen so if you need that we want you to write these down it helps to get this in our minds better but this is the good news there had been this radical change Judah had come back that's the evidence let's provide more evidence now we're jumping on to chapter 43 this is maybe a year or two later on okay when the grain had they had brought from Egypt was almost gone Jacob said to his sons go again and buy us a little food but Judah said there's your evidence you wanted to see it it's there Judah said now Judah had come home there it is Judah said the man oh by the way who's the man Joseph, you know the story. The man wasn't joking when he warned that we couldn't see him again unless Benjamin came along. If you let him come with us, we will go down and buy some food. Now, I want to pause there. Why is Judah speaking? Who is the oldest brother? Reuben, you're right. Why is it not Reuben who speaks up? When you have a chance... It's a sad story. You go back to the previous chapter. You find out that Reuben did speak up in chapter 42 towards the end. He said, Dad, send the lad with me. Send Benjamin with me. And we'll go down and buy grain. And the father said, absolutely not. Now, I'm adding in my own words, Jacob may have thought, the last time I sent my favorite boy down to visit, he never came back. You think I'm going to send my other favorite son? (laughs) No way. And Reuben wishy-washy Reuben how do I know you'll see it in the scripture he couldn't stand firm he couldn't stand faithful this is Reuben's logic dad if I don't bring Benjamin back home you can kill two of my sons by the way any grandparents here raise your hand hi quickly I want to see grandparents how do you like that logic your son says to you if I don't bring your son back Kill two of your grandkids. How many of you like that? It just doesn't make sense. You read the story. This is Reuben. If I don't bring your son back, kill two of your grandkids. Now, you understand why Judah is stepping into the lead position. This is the same Judah who has gone away. This is the same Judah now who speaks up and says, send the lad. Oh, how is J- uh, Jacob the father going to respond? What is he going to say? Judah said to Israel, his father, Israel, Jacob, same guy two names send the boy with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die both we and you and also our little ones I will be notice Judas says I will be pledge notice that I will be a pledge of his safety from my hand you shall require him if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you then let me bear the blame forever Interesting. Judah doesn't say you can kill your two grandkids. <laughs> he said, I will bear the blame. Obviously, a change has come about in the life of Judah. This man who had so many problems, it's very clear. Judah has developed into a trusted son. Now, as we study the life of Judah, it's fascinating, folks, to see what God can do for us. Now, this, by the way, is from Young's Literal Translation. Anybody heard of that Bible? Let's see the hands. A few hands are going up. Normally I use the New King James Version. But Young's literal translation is the one that brings this out very clearly. In English, we use the word came for a singular. He came or they came. Are you with me? You never know if it's singular or plural. 
if you see the word Cain. But Young's little translation shows what the actual Hebrew says. And Judah, parenthetically, his brothers also. Cain cometh in unto the house of Joseph, and he is yet there, and they fall before him to the earth. Now, I know it's old English from 1800 and something, but Young's little translation has captured the point. The Bible's focus is on Judah. The brothers are mentioned just parenthetically. It's Judah came, oh, his brothers came as well. It's fascinating how the change happens now. If you simply read it in normal English, and Judah and his brothers came, you think it means all of them. But actually the Hebrew is very clear, and Young's literal translation brings this out. And Judah, his brothers also, Judah is the one who cometh. Fascinating. The emphasis has shifted now to this brother. It's not Reuben who is the leader. It's clear that Judah has become the leader. Fascinating. Now, Judah steps forward. Chapter 46, 44, verse 16. And by the way, you know this part of the story. I'm only giving you the life of Judah. And the pause right here. You know, one day, Lord willing, I'm hoping to write a book or put together the two stories of Judah and Joseph. Because you know the story of Joseph. I'm not even telling you that story. This is after the time when Benjamin was accused of stealing the cup. You know the story. And this is the time that they'd come back together and uh, they were now guilty and so forth, supposedly. And this is Judah who's coming forward. So I'm not even telling you that part of the story. But Lord willing, one day I'm hoping to write that book called A Tale of Two Siblings. With apologies to you know who, right? Charles Dickens. And the book begins this way. It was the best of sons. It was the worst of sons. Because it's interesting how the Bible has put the two together. You've got the Joseph in chapter 37, Judah in chapter 38, Joseph in chapter 39, and now we find Judah. It's a fascinating contrast. It's incredible. And, and I'm thankful to God for the story of Joseph. I'm not going to minimize it right now. The story of Joseph in chapter 39, where he stands for the right, though the heavens fall. But we also have the counter story of Judah, who runs and falls into sin. God put the two stories there for a purpose. One, we want to encourage everyone, especially young people, to stand like Joseph did in chapter 39. But what happens if you do fall? Chapter 38 is there. And then the continued story now in chapter 46. This is Judah who has stepped forward to the man. And Judah says, who's the man, by the way? The man is Joseph. Judah steps forward. Oh, my Lord, what can we say to you? How can we plead? They don't know it's Joseph. Joseph knows who they are. How can we prove our innocence? God is punishing us for our sins. My Lord, we have all returned to be your slaves. We and our brother who had your cup in his sack. Now, let's go to verse 17. I'm going to read this from the Bible. I don't have it on the screen. This is in Genesis chapter 44. This is Joseph responding. Verse 17. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so to take all of you as slaves. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, and a little, little almost, I don't know if, I, I wish I could put the sarcasm or the tongue in cheek, because Joseph knows the turmoil they're going through. He says, as for you, go up in peace to your father. <laughs> Do you get the picture, right? They, their father was, they knew this is serious stuff. This is Joseph. Now, from verse 18, I want you to note, from verse 18 until the end of the chapter, verse 34. What's that? How many verses? 17 verses? Eight, yeah, something like that? This is the longest speech in the entire book of Genesis. And when I asked you two weeks ago, how many of you have heard one sermon on the life of Judah? There were a smattering of hands. And I know it. when I grew up within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I don't remember ever hearing about Judah except the tribe of Judah, right? <laughs> That's about it. And fascinating, he's got the longest speech in the entire book. Which is why it's exciting. We come together, we study the written word of God. So we can better learn about the living word of God, Jesus Christ. And it's fascinating as we dig into the word of God, we will see many important lessons for us. This is now Judah stepping forward. By the way, he has become a bold spokesman. Put that in your study guide. We've got him down as a, he has developed into a trusted son our third point, Judah has become a bold spokesman. I, I'm keeping these up so every time if you miss the word, you can get them up on the next uh, round. Fascinating. Judah is speaking now to the man, the governor, on behalf of the man who has been considered guilty. 
Judah stepped forward, verse 18. Genesis 44, verse 18. Stepped forward and said, My Lord, let me say just this one word to you. Be patient with me for a moment, for I know you could have me killed in an instant as though you were Pharaoh himself. Now, if you were Joseph, what would be going through your mind? This is the same Judah who said, let's sell Joseph. This is 20 years or so later. And this is the same Judah who is now appealing to that very Joseph. And he doesn't know it. Appealing to the Joseph that he suggested that they sell into slavery, a fate to be feared worse than death. Verse 18, this is Judah stepping forward, making the appeal. Now notice the language of verses 30 and 31. And now, my Lord, I cannot go back to my father without the boy. Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. When he sees that the boy is not with us, our father will die. We will be responsible for bringing his gray head down to the grave in sorrow. It's clear that Judah has gotten to love his father. Now what's interesting, go back to verse 20. Going back to verse 20 and Judah is now reminding the governor, who he doesn't know is Joseph, of what they had told him on their first trip. You see? So we said to my Lord when we came down last time, in other words, we have an aged father and a young brother, notice, the child of his old age. This one's full brother is dead. Stop there. When Joseph heard the words of Judah, this one's brother is dead, who was he talking about? About Joseph. How would you like to meet your family one day when they come and they talk to you and they say, and you're dead? What emotions would go through you? How would you feel when you suddenly realize for the first time that your entire family believes you're dead and they're talking to you and they don't know it? Wow. So this is what he's telling him. This one's full brother is dead. And since he, baby brother Benjamin, is the only one by that mother who is left, notice the language, his father what? Dotes on him. His father dotes on him. Now it's interesting folks, this is 20 years later. And I hope your kids are listening. And I say kids, those whose parents are here. It's interesting. 20 something years later, Jacob is still playing favorites. But you know what? God has worked a miracle in the life of Judah. So much so, you'll see, okay, what's happening. Judah is, has learned to love his dad despite his dad's faults. I think I heard a mother say amen there. Isn't that interesting? He says, I cannot go back without the lad. Because if I do, my dad will die. My dad that is still playing favorites. But Judah has been transformed by God's grace. So that he loves his dad despite his dad's faults. I hope you young people are listening. By the way, your dads are not perfect yet. Or mothers. And I want to urge you, encourage you. Learn from the life of Judah. Judah loved his dad in spite of his dad's faults. Why? You'll see soon. Here's the key verse in the entire chapter, I believe. In the entire book of Genesis, I believe. We get towards the end, the second last verse. Notice what Judah now says. Appealing to the governor. Still not knowing who he's talking to other than he's the governor. He says, please, my lord. Or sir, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. Think about the implications of this, friends, family. Slavery in Egypt was a fate to be feared worse than death. What is Judah essentially saying? What is he saying? I am willing to die a slow, painful death for the guilty boy. God has been working an incredible miracle in the life of, jo of Judah. Judah is willing to die, notice, for the guilty. Did you notice I put the word guilty in quotes? As far as he knew, am I right? As far as they knew, as far as the brothers knew, baby brother Benjamin was guilty of stealing the cup. They had no other knowledge. And by the way, perception is reality. They believed it. Judah was willing to die for his guilty brother. Judah 
is an incredible story. I thank God for the story of Judah. In fact, the story of Judah is Linda, one of Linda's favorite Bible stories, obviously besides Jesus. Because it's a story that gives us hope, that gives us the hope that God can change the worst of us. God can transform those of us who've really messed up. And if you read the story of Judah, uh, in fact, just so you know, I realize it's a difficult story. I try to tell it in such a way that it's appropriate. But I, when I one day shared this some years ago, a man came up, he was in his 70s, he said, thank you, thank you so much. When we were kids, our parents used to always read through the Bible, from Genesis all the way through. But we never read chapter 38. We'd always get to 37, skip it and go to 38. And we would run into the bedroom, go read the story afterwards. So our parents would never let us read chapter 38. Thank you, now I see chapter 38 is a story of hope. It's a story of God's forgiving grace in the life of this man. But you know what? There was one more job that they had to do. Remember, they had to go back home and <laughs> go back home and get their father to bring their father back. And when they get home, they gave Jacob, Israel, this report. Uh, uh, Daddy, <clears throat> and, uh, we got uh, something to tell you. <laughs> Joseph, um, uh, you know, the, 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 Joseph, your, your, your older favorite boy. And Joseph, uh, Joseph is still alive. <laughs> okay? Joseph is still alive. He is at this moment governor of all Egypt. <laughs> now notice, talking about Jacob, he, but he was as one stunned for he did not believe them. He couldn't believe it. If you, friends, have believed for 20 years that someone is dead, do you know how you're going to react? In fact, next week, God willing, if you're here, I'm going to share with you a personal testimony. It's called uh, Delivered from Death, a Marathon of Miracles. It's a testimony, and my wife Linda will be up here with me sharing. So be here. But, but there were people that thought I was dead, that believed I was dead, and we showed up in church, and you should have seen their faces. <laughs> It was, uh, it was interesting. <laughs> I was dead. You know, it's, just, it's weird. It's absolutely weird. I understand this, having seen the faces of people who thought I was dead. Wow. Now, but think about the rest of the implication. If Judah and his brothers have to come back and say, uh, Joseph is alive, what is the obvious implication? What did they have to do? Confess, you knew that, <laughs> right? They're like, Dad, um, the guy that we tried to act as though had been torn to pieces by, you know, remember the robe we brought and all that thing? Well, Dad, we are sorry. I love the way Patriarchs and Prophets, page 232, puts it, and it's right there in your study sheet. You can read it with me. Let's read it from the study sheet or from the screen. Another act of humiliation remained for the ten brothers. They now confessed to their father the deceit and cruelty that for so many years had embittered his life and theirs. Jacob had not suspected them of so base a sin, but he saw, oh, this is nice. I hope parents, you, you see this especially. But he, as a parent, saw that all had been overruled for good. In other words, God is in control, okay? All had been overruled for good, and he forgave and blessed his erring children. Kids make mistakes and sometimes, notice these kids hid the mistake for decades from their weeping, wailing father. They confessed. <sighs> Judah confesses his guilt. Our next word for our study guide, Judah confesses his guilt with his brothers obviously and apologizes. But our focus is on the life of Judah. Judah confesses and now he apologizes he goes ahead and makes things right with his father god has wrought a marvelous change in the life of this man now we're going to hurry on towards the end of the story i'm going to encourage you go home and take time to reread fascinating details in the life of judah but we're going to move ahead now to genesis 49 so turn in your bibles to chapter 49 of genesis and spend a few moments there reflecting Last five minutes, we want to look at Genesis 49 because this is Judah, uh, Jacob rather, Jacob the father, or Israel, his other name. He calls his sons together. My Bible has a heading, Jacob's last words to his son. I, I know sons, I know some Bibles say Jacob's prophecies or Jacob's blessings. I don't like the word blessings, no, <laughs> because when you start with the first son, again, you know, right there in verse 3, uh, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the strength, uh, the beginning of my strength, the excellence of dignity, the excellence of power, unstable as water, you shall not excel. 
because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, he went up to my couch. How would you like to stand by your father's bedside when he starts telling the rest of the family what you've been doing? And your father is dying. He gets to Simeon and Levi. And the next verse, verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in the anger they slew a man, and in their self will they hamstrung, hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Wow, folks, I, I pray that this will never happen when you stand around your bedside, the bedside of your father. This is not good news. So don't see this as the blessings, okay? These are not blessings. These are warnings that Jacob was giving to his sons in a nutshell, saying, if you and your family continue in the direction you've been going, trouble will come upon you generation after generation. Now, if we hurry forward to verse uh, 20, uh, oh, by the way, Asher, Naphtali, they have short uh, sentences about them. But what's interesting, Joseph, five verses are kept for blessings for Joseph. That's verses 22 to 26. Those five verses are all about Joseph. But our message today is about the rest of the life of Judah. So let's go now and see what we can find in Genesis 49 verses 8 through 12. We'll just touch on a couple key verses. So Genesis chapter 49 verse 8. Genesis 49 verse 8. And uh, if you remember, the name Judah in Hebrew, Yehuda, sounds like uh, a Hebrew word, Yaduka. It's an intentional paranomasia for the English teachers out there. We often call it a pun. And so here, uh, Jacob does this intentionally. Yehuda, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall yuduka. You get that? It's a nice play on words. I mentioned last time, I said, if you're Hispanic and you're living in Arizona, and, and you say, we, we are living in Arizona, let's name our first daughter Ana Rosa. Just to remind you that you were living there at that point. It's an intentional play on words. And this is where he starts. Yehuda, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall yaduka, shall praise. He continues, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. The issue of power. So we've got praise, we've got power. These are the blessings that Jacob the father is now bestowing and, and uh, passing on to the bad boy of the family. The guy who was the one who said sell him into slavery. The favorite son. This is the bad boy who left the faith of his fathers. Who gave up the, the belief of his grandfather. He just left completely and then he went lived out there in the so-called in the world. Married outside the faith. Raised these rebel sons. Was an absentee husband. A promiscuous man. A deceptive father-in-law. A quick to condemn judge. This is the same man who's getting all these blessings. What is happening? I love the next one. The next one is like wait a minute minute Jacob are you uh, perhaps suffering from an early onset of dementia because if you read it carefully read it carefully your father's children the actual Hebrew says your father's sons hence I put it in your study guide your father's sons shall bow down before you wait a minute Jacob who had the dream of the sons bowing to his, his brothers who was it it was Joseph What's happening here? Fascinating story. The major blessings of the firstborn are being transferred now to the fourthborn. Fascinating. Interesting. It should have gone to Reuben, the most important blessings. Right? You know that, the preeminent son. Jacob would have preferred to give it to his pet boy, Joseph. But instead, folks, Jacob is passing the most important blessings Unto the pardoned boy. Not the preeminent, not the pet, but to the pardoned. It's fascinating. He is giving the most important blessings. Now, it is true. If you get later on, I was just reading the book of Joshua this week. As you get into the book of Joshua, it indicates that Joshua's two sons, not sorry, Joshua, uh, Joseph's two sons, this is in the book of Joshua, Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, got two parcels of land because they became two tribes. Yes. And in that sense, they got a double portion of the physical land. But the oldest boy, the most important, got three blessings. The blessings of land, property, the blessings of leadership, and ultimately the blessings of the Messiah coming through that boy. 
So yes, Joseph did get a double portion of the physical blessings, but notice what's happening as Jacob is bestowing blessing after blessing on Judah. We'll skip to verse 10. There are five verses. Notice, five verses of blessings for Joseph, and guess how many verses for Judah? Five verses of blessings for Judah. Verse 10 is a key verse, folks. It's right there in your study guide. Let's reflect on it. The rod of authority will not be taken from Judah, and he will not be without the lawgiver. Here is the Here's the blessing of leadership. And we know that the leaders came from Judah. The kings, you know, David, Solomon, the leaders came through him. By the way, there's not one king in the entire book of the Bible who came through the line of Reuben. Not there. Reuben was actually the first one. But the, a lot of these kings come through the line of Judah. Here it is, the first part. The second part, until Shiloh comes. You can fill it in on your study sheet. Until Shiloh comes. Okay, and by the way, there's a tradition amongst the Jews that Shiloh is a term that refers to the coming Messiah. Until Shiloh comes, and they were, they're right, they are right. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, that is, of the nations. And so my new international revised version, I saw that and it's correct. To him shall be the obedience of the nations. Fascinating story. Who is Jacob referring to, yes, the Messiah, pointing to Jesus Christ. Ultimately, as we look at the story, what about the sins? How come you don't hear Judah uh, being castigated? You, Jacob could have said, you Judah, you wicked boy. You said, sell Joseph. You're a mercenary brother. You ignored your father's tears. You're a hard-hearted son, a worldly young man. But it's not there. It's all wiped away, folks. Completely erased. Why? Only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not a word is mentioned of the multiple sins of this bad boy, of this prodigal, of the man who has come back to Jesus. I love the way it ends. In other words, in a nutshell, Judah is treated as if he had what? Never sinned. Judah is treated as if he had never sinned. Write those two words down as if he had never sinned. And you'll notice the next line in your study guide. It's not on the screen. The study guide we point out. This, this is how God treats us when we're forgiven through Christ. Add the word Christ there. The Messiah, Jesus Christ. This is exactly how God will treat us. Completely wipes it out. You know what's interesting? As you study the lives of the three brothers, the oldest brother, Reuben, the firstborn of Leah. Okay, let's be more precise. The firstborn of Leah. Joseph, the firstborn of whom? Rachel. We got two firstborns there. The firstborn in real terms, the real firstborn, and then the man who became the favorite son. But who gets the most important blessings? The blessings of leadership in the kingdom and the blessings of the Lord coming through. Guess who gets it? Not the firstborn, not the favored but the forgiven son. And I read the story and I'm just awed by the incredible grace of God. Isn't it incredible? This is the way God treats us. This is the way God will treat you. Before we get to our last verse, I have a question. Again, I ask the question. There are more of us here now. Are there any golfers out here? Raise your hands quickly. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anyone who plays mini golf, including. Raise your hands high. Because <laughs> I can raise mine now. <laughs> Okay, because I'll tell you, this week I learned a new word. You can see I'm really not a golfer. Somebody was talking to me and said, oh, it's a mulligan. I said, what? Anybody heard of a mulligan and know what it is? Uh-huh, you see? And, and so, you know, this little ball was teaching me a lesson this week. A mulligan for those of us like me who were ignorant until, until this week. A mulligan, oh, you, don't, you can't play it in strict golf, okay? But uh, it's a wonderful thing. It's a kind of a do-over, a second chance that you get if you've really messed up a shot, often at the beginning of a game, and it's, it's without a penalty. It, you're treated as though you have never even hit the ball. Isn't that correct? Yeah, okay. So I, I, did, I, checked, I went to Wikipedia. I want to make sure they got their notes right. Huh? <laughs> now, what's interesting, even further, a mulligan is used not only of golf, it is used of other sports as well. Uh, it's, it's a minor blunder which is allowed to pass unnoticed without consequence generally because the one making the mistake is a beginner. But now, guess what's happening? And I know this church is 
and I praise God for that, big on relationships. The mulligan is now used in relationships. If you mess up in a relationship through some foolish action, you regret it, you can wish for a mulligan. <laughs> and as I'm reading about the mulligan, it's like, yes, this is the story. I believe that the story of Judah is a story where God treats Judah as if he had never sinned. He wipes it out completely. This is the story of a gracious God. Yes, when you've messed up, when I've messed up, you can wish for a mulligan. Okay, now we've learned some new golf language. <laughs> and, 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 you can, and God is the God of second chances. By the way, when I read the stuff out about the mulligan, it talked about minor problems. But I'm thankful that the God I serve, the God you serve, is the God of major mulligans. And not just of one mulligan, he is the God of multiple major mulligans. As I look at the story of Judah, I am excited. How do I know that? Because the Bible is very clear. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, you know the rest? He is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When I'm reading the story of Judah, I'm excited. I see this, by the way, this cleansing from all unrighteousness is what I consider a marvelous mulligan metaphor. Cleansing us from all unrighteousness. It's all wiped out. We can start afresh. Our story ends. Finally, one verse. Revelation chapter 5. One of the elders said to me, weep. Notice, echoes back to Jacob weeping. <laughs> Interesting. Weep no more. You think back of Jacob. Okay. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Reuben. Is that what your Bible says? The lion of the tribe of Joseph. No, it's not there, folks. The lion of the tribe of whom? Of Judah. Write those in. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And, and verse 6, by the way, says, uh, John says, I looked and he noticed that the divine being is the lamb. The lion is the lamb of God. And what I love about the story of Judah, it's the story of a second chance. I have three quick questions to ask today. In front of you, there's even a pencil. You may need one. The first question is a general question. And I hope that uh, you would... Think about that seriously. One, how many of you may know of, I've asked it before, but some may not have heard this before. How many of you know of, are acquainted with, perhaps, a family member, a colleague, a classmate, or a member of this church who may have, unfortunately, for whatever the reason, drifted away like Judah? Let me see the hands, because I'm raising mine. That's 80, 90% of our church. I'm going to ask you a favor. Not really for me, for, by God's grace. The next week or two, would you pray about that person or those people? Number one. Number two, would you write down their name and contact information? Find it. Could you try and do that? By the way, those of you who raised your hands, I hope you're writing these three things down. Pray about it. Write the name and number down. Okay, because I'm going to ask you something in the future. And then number the third thing, Ask what God would have you do about that. I'm going to be inviting you from the congregation to join me and or our leaders. Already I've got about a dozen who've signed up and said, we want to go past and visit those who are not anymore worshiping with us. When I say those who are missing, people who have not been here for some months. Maybe several weeks you've not seen them. People who perhaps for whatever reason are having a major challenge in their faith. Number one, pray for that person or those people. Number two, Write their name down in the contact information. Number three, ask what God would have you do. Because I would love it if you would come with me and say, he's my friend. I've not been in touch with him. I want to go with you, Pastor. I want to go with one of our elders, one of our other leaders, to go and invite my friend back. Because God is the God of the major mulligans. God is the God of the second chances. God is the God who gives you another opportunity to come back. God wants us to come back. So do that. Those of you who raise your hands, would you be willing to do that? Let me see those who've raised your hands. How many do we have? Praise God. Do that for the next couple weeks. I'm, I'm going to want to trip soon. I'll be here next Sabbath. But as you think and pray about that, I would like to have a response, and we're hoping to start doing that in the future. Question number two. This church, in fact, this morning, one of my elders came to me and said, we're so glad you're here. And I said, oh, I and Linda are so happy to be here. We are so blessed, constantly blessed. And we are just overwhelmed with the way you have treated us and welcomed us. And I'm thankful for that. 
So here's my question. Think about this for a moment. The way that Jacob the father treated Judah. The way that our loving father is willing to treat us when we come back. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I believe that this church will be willing to warmly welcome back anyone who is straight. Am I right? Now, here's, here's the commitment. Is there anyone here who today is actually going to stand? By the way, there are a few who are, they've alerted me. They're going to leave to go to the memorial service for uh, Clayton Horse. So we understand that. Is there anyone here who wants to make a commitment not to me, but to God? Because I want to have a prayer with you. Who wants to stand and say, I, by God's grace, want to be the way Jacob welcomed that person back. I want to be there to encourage, to support the Jacob like Jacob, the Judas who've come back. And not only that, by God's grace, I want to even help to get them into working for the Lord. Judah became a leader, folks. I'm hoping by God's grace we can be willing to welcome back people and to, as time goes on, it took Judah a couple of years to prove he was serious. He had the fruits of his repentance were there, but we're, we want to welcome folks back. Who is there who's going to stand? One or two, three, who are saying, I will commit myself to encouraging, facilitating anybody who may have left. left. I want to be there as a member of this church. Maybe you're a regular visitor. Who wants to stand with me and with our elders to willing to encourage, to facilitate anyone who may come back to Jesus? This is the church. I want to see a commitment, not to me. This is a commitment to anyone who comes back. Praise God. You are making a personal commitment. If people come, we will welcome them with open arms. Praise God for you. Thank you for standing. This is a commitment to the Lord. We want to be like Jacob. We want to be like Jesus. We want to welcome folk back into the fold. One more question. Eight weeks ago to this day, Eight weeks ago, as I was leaving Sabbath school, I will never forget, Cliff came to me and said, Pastor, there are people who are often willing and ready to make a decision for Jesus. I don't know who you are. Is there anyone here today who feels that you need to make a personal commitment to turn around? You know what's been happening in your life. Perhaps you've never accepted Jesus ever. You want to come forward this morning to make that personal type of Judah commitment to Jesus. I want to live my life for him. Our elders are up front. They're gonna, we're going to pray together. We're going to invite anyone here. I want to make that invitation. If you've never personally given your life to Jesus, this is your opportunity. Or if you want to make a radical transition, you want to make that turnaround, we're going to invite you. Our elders will step up a couple steps here. We're going to come and invite you to join us. So come forward. We want to pray with you. A new start today by God's grace. Anybody want to come up and join us? We welcome you. Amen. Anybody else? Come and join us. First time or a renewed commitment to Jesus. Wait a moment longer. Anybody who wants to make that personal stand. We're going to transition now into our hymn. Because we don't know your heart, so we pray that the Lord will continue to bless you, that you will reflect on the life of Judah, and you will, at the right time, make the decision when God calls you. We're going to invite our uh, pastor, Gary, who is, uh, been with, who is with us today, and Shelley, and Ludell. They're coming up. We're going to sing a beautiful hymn, which is going to challenge us to go out and reach others for Jesus. So we're going to sing this song, number 373, Seeking the Lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray. 
The men are going to be leading in the chorus. That's why Pastor Gary is going to be with me. And thank you, Shelly, for joining Ludell on the chorus for the ladies doing the second part. We're ready. Seeking the lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray. Come unto me, his message repeating, words of the Master speaking today. Going afar. that are sore, leading them forth in ways of salvation, showing the path to life evermore, going afar. I would go on missions of mercy, following life from day unto day, cheering the faint and raising the fallen, pointing the lost to Jesus the way, going afar. Lord for that call. Thank you for giving us the privilege of singing this hymn as a dedication of our willingness to reach out to bring the lost lambs back to the fold. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for the story of Judah. Thank you for your overwhelming grace. And may each one of us here be welcome to be willing to welcome back whoever may have strayed and come back to you. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.